Hello and welcome to today's In Session, Mental Health and Wellness in Music. I'm Jen Mendia, representing for So Far Sounds today. We'll learn unique perspectives on the best ways to maintain and sustain your mental health and wellness throughout your music career. Today, I'm joined by Emmeline Rasmussen, Shell, AKA our daughter, and Spencer Hughes. So let's start with you, Emmeline. Uh, please share with everyone your preferred gender pronouns and a bit about who you are. Hi, my name is Emmeline. I use the she, her pronouns, um, and I run a startup called Sound Nutrition that provides nutrition and wellness services to touring artists and crew. Um, so a little bit of what I do, a typical day involves um, going through the routing of my clients' tours and identifying and procuring healthy options in each of the different cities they're in. Um, I might teach in-person or virtual yoga, depending on the client and, and their needs. Um, so I've, I've actually been out on tour, but then also I, I tend to work a lot with clients remotely as well. Um, and then finally, stocking their tour bus or, or van, um, making sure they have a good rider in place so that they have all the health and wellness essentials in the green room and just uh, being a wellness resource. Wow, love all that and can't wait to get more into it. Shell, take it away. Uh, hey everyone, uh, my name's Shell, based in, in Denver, Colorado. I use she, her pronouns. And I would identify as a healing artist and a songwriter and also uh, do um, life and creativity coaching. So kind of taking mental health, mindfulness, sound and combining it all um, within music, ultimately to create spaces that are supportive for the healing journey, which I would say is the human journey. So. Love it. You can tell this is already going to be a juicy conversation. Spencer, last but absolutely not <laughs> least. Hi, I'm Spencer Townsend Hughes, co-founder of Music Minds Matter, also based in Denver, Colorado. Uh, preferred pr pronouns are he, him. Uh, yeah, started Music Minds Matter. We just celebrated our second anniversary of being a nonprofit on April 14th. So we provide mental wellness resources to musicians in the music community. Um, and we're very grateful to be on this panel. Well, thanks so much for joining y'all. Uh, this is already so exciting. We'll be covering several topics related to mental health and wellness and music for the first 45 minutes or so of our discussion. And then we'll leave time for Q&A at the end. And I'll go over a few housekeeping items. This is a supportive and uplifting space. So we wanna keep all the dialogue in the chat respectful as we get into the discussion. Um, please feel free to use the chat, where you share where you're tuning in from, show your support or your connection to the topics that we're discussing. Um, and then we, when using the chat function, just make sure that um, you're checked to all panelists and attendees or everyone so that we can all see what you're saying. And then if you have questions during the webinar, there's a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen for you to submit them. And we'll have a moderator helping to gather those questions and we'll answer them towards the end of the session. Um, and then you should automatically receive a short survey after the session so we can get your thoughts and feedback. So with that all out of the way, let's get into this conversation. And let's just start with what mental health and wellness means to each of you. So Shell, if you wanna start the conversation. Yeah, sure. Um, I think ultimately mental health and wellness is this holistic thing that really is like, how are you doing as a human being? Are you connected with yourself? Um, so I think even though we use the term mental health, that it really is thinking about mind and body and how you're connected within kind of your own ecosystem and then how do you relate to the world around you? I think ultimately it's, do you have an awareness of, of what's going on within you and, and how you're doing? Because ultimately everything really, really flows from that. Mm, I love that perspective. Yeah, Spencer? Yeah, I think uh, mental health and wellness is like, I think it's like mental wellness and brain health to like kind of separate the physical from the mental kind of aspect of things. Um, and oftentimes we get, con I think we get conflicted uh, about like the separation between like physical health and mental health, yet they're kind of tethered to each other. Um, as uh, Emily might tell us uh, and share with us uh, here shortly, but uh, I think that taking care of your mental health and wellness is, uh, it's paramount to productivity, to creativity, to living a healthy life. Um, and so, yeah, we, we really strive to kind of advocate for that, share resources and be able to give people the tools they need in order to start caring for themselves. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we, we hammer home that all these things are tied together, but you just won't believe it till you see it, right? Emmeline, what about you? Yeah, for me, mental health um, encompasses my community, my relationships, my relationship with myself, 
Um, and, and kind of self-awareness of, you know, when you are having thoughts that may not necessarily support your mental health or even actions, you know, getting into patterns that may not necessarily support one's own mental health, being able to identify them, recognize them, um, and turn to your support network, whether it's your healthcare providers, whether it's your friends and family. Um, so, so I guess it's that self-awareness and then kind of this constant journey of, um, of, learning to care for oneself and all the different aspects of their mental health, including nutrition, exercise, sleep, hydration, community, relationships, all of it. Wow. And what I'm so excited about this conversation is that y'all are all coming from such different angles. And just from this first question alone, I can see that. So I'm really excited to dive in. So with that being said, um, what resources can you share for artists looking for preventative and or an emergency support? And feel free to jump in. I'll, I'll jump in first, if you don't mind. I think uh, that's exactly the direction in which Music Minds Matter is heading is the preventative. So we, uh, we're we fortunate that we have a few instructors on our staff who are in, uh, instructors in mental health first aid. And essentially mental health first aid is how to recognize a mental health crisis and then what to do, like the action steps to take in order to help deescalate a mental health crisis. And so for mental health prevention, unfortunately, you can't really know what prevention is until you have a mental health crisis. And I've suffered from panic attacks and anxiety and depression for most of my life. And so I've certainly felt the, um, the side effects of, of that crisis. So I would say as far as prevention is concerned, specifically in the music scene, it's what are the things that are causing you the most stress? A lot of musicians struggle with putting together an EPK. A lot of musicians struggle with uh, getting booked at shows and uh, they're struggling to figure out who to contact in order to start booking more shows and things like this. So really starting like a mentorship program with bands who have been in the scene for ages to really start to build community instead of this competitive uh, kind of uh, this competitive center uh, that that is supposed to be community built, you know, it's community driven. And so a lot of things that we try to do with Music Minds Matter is talk about health. Are Yeah, are you eating the right things? Are you exercising? Are you getting enough sun? Are you drinking enough water? Are you getting enough sleep? So if you can make a checklist, so when you start to feel those kind of uh, the, the worsening side effects of mental health crisis, then you're able to recognize that, go back to your toolbox, check off some of those items and make sure that you're taking care of yourself. Mm, love that. We love a checklist. We love ticking a box. Amazing. <laughs> Ladies, anything else to, to add there? I mean, that was that was so perfect. But um, in terms of other resources, uh, you know, certainly seeking out wellness resources that support your mental health. So, you know, I'll, I'll ring the sound nutrition bell here. Um, we support, we have lots of resources for artists um, at all levels. And then, you know, there are other organizations too that even can provide some financial support as well. Um, and, you know, and their crisis helplines, of course, as well. I love that. I want to jump in just because, Shell, you have this unique take on breath work. And I want to see how you've used that and, and how artists can use breath work to aid in their healing journey, because it's not something that I'm super familiar with. And I think our audience could definitely benefit from hearing from you. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting when you talked about resources, my mind immediately went to the resources, not in terms of like organizational, um, but within our own access, like right now. And one of the two things that came to mind was breath and sleep. And they're so practical, but really how do we prevent um, anxiety from coming up or our nervous system from being dysregulated and uh, so simple that just getting enough sleep it's so simple but I mean admittedly I have not got enough sleep this week so I'm practicing um, but I think that's one of them but in terms of the breath that you asked about um, in terms of breath work as a, a modality there's definitely um, specific types of breath work that you can do like in longer sessions. There's one type of breath work I've done where it's like an almost like an hour long class where you're breathing in a certain type of manner. There's a facilitator that's guiding you because breath work can bring up a lot of things you're not expecting somatically. Sometimes your mind knows what's happening and sometimes you're just feeling all these things and you don't know what they are because the breath really i i heard this statistic i need to research if it's true but 70 percent of our toxins are released through the breath which i'm like if that's true that's amazing and i imagine there's some truth there so 
Um, but in terms of, so there's specific modalities you can do that can be just the same kind of a thing. If you're like, oh, I'm going to go to therapy once a week, or I'm going to go do uh, an exercise class once a week or run, you can do breath work as a practice. Um, but then simply like even right now in this moment that we have access to breath and breath is a way that connects us to our body and really brings us into the present and helps us really check in with what's going on. And so I'd say one simple practice that people could take away even today or whenever you're listening is simply closing your eyes, cutting off that sensory information, um, putting a hand on your heart if that's helpful or somewhere in your body that feels comforting and just take three deep breaths. And if you haven't done it before, it's going to feel like it takes forever, but it literally is maybe 15 seconds. And it's wild how it can totally just change your mood um, or your perception or even get your mind clear. So very, very simple um, and accessible literally immediately to you. Wow. I love that. And that it, I, I love that. And I'm like ready to set up a session with you. Um, and I actually, you just touched on accessibility. And so I want to talk, talk to you all about that. What are good practices for folks that don't have a lot of accessibility to maybe uh, good, good nutrition or gyms or mental health counseling? What do you recommend for folks in that arena? Um, you know, so, so there are resources like Music Cares, um, and then, and, you know, there are other organizations um, within Music Cares too that, um, you know, there are foundations that, that contribute to this type of work. Sound Nutrition actually for the last week of the, of the month for every, um, for every client that signs on, they actually have the option to um, gift a counseling session to a, an artist that maybe needs it. So there's kind of like peer-to-peer -peer support as well. Um, and then there, there are free resources online too. And, and I think groups like this are a perfect example of that because being able to, um, to interact with, with others that maybe are going through the same things or um, being able to get some of this information from professionals like ourselves, um, it, you know, it's such a fabulous, fabulous opportunity. But I will say, even at all levels, um, at all levels, there are ways to get healthy food. So one thing that I that I counsel a lot of my bands on is if you're touring in a sprinter van, go to Trader Joe's, get some of, or, or maybe it's not Trader Joe's, but you know, get some of those like little packets of raw nuts and, and dried fruit and some of those packets of the, you know, whole grain, not the sugary, um, the, the whole grain instant oatmeal. And if it load in, all they have is coffee and soda or, you know, donuts and coffee, um, or maybe nothing at all. If you can get hot water, you can make yourself oatmeal in the morning, um, for, for a dollar. Uh, with, you know, with things like that. And I, I, I teach people about, and this is something that maybe we should do a, a little video about, but I teach people about what you can do at a gas station. What's the healthiest thing you can find to eat at a gas station? What's the healthiest thing you can find to eat at an airport? Um, where are the, what are the fast foods that are, you know, not necessarily as detrimental? What can you get at Chipotle or, um, you know, if Chipotle is not accessible, what can get at Wendy's? Mm. Okay, Wendy's. Emmeline, <laughs> I love that, and I, I am, uh, I'm almost to my seven seven month mark of eating plant based diets. So I'm like, I'm right there with you on like sorting out like what you can eat, what you can't eat, you know, and just being very mindful of that. And you know, even just changing my diet over the last seven months has made such an impact uh, on my mental health, on my physical health. Um, and so, yeah, thank you so much for sharing those, those resources. We at Music Minds Matter, we're fortunate enough to have someone on staff who is also my mom and she's the sweetest lady on the planet. Um, but she has, she worked in the mental health field for 12 years uh, at the Aurora Mental Health Center. And what she was doing, she was an employment specialist. So what we would do is we would help folks um, who were struggling to find work to get them work and to like maintain their positions. But also what she would do is help sign up for Medicaid and Medicare. So uh, I don't know, historically musicians uh, don't have insurance or, or will struggle to like find access and accessibility to therapy and other different resources. So that's something that we offer through Music Minds Matter is helping folks sign up for Medicaid and Medicare. Um, and also uh, peer support groups. Uh, musicians have a difficult time um, because of the stigma of mental health, talking to therapists or admitting that they're talking to therapists or admitting that they need to talk to therapists or mental health professionals. So starting a peer support group, we started a, a group five years ago called uh, the Mental Wellness Meetups, where I was struggling myself with like, 
we're getting ready to put a record out. Who's going to come to our show? Who's going to listen to it? Why am I doing this to myself? Yada, yada, yada. The, the conversation that every musician has maybe five times in their musical career. Uh, but we started a support group for musicians who might have been feeling the same thing. And so we've been running those monthly uh, for the last five years. And the outcome has just been so wonderful. And to be able to support our peers in our community through that group, those who might be afraid of taking the next step to go see a mental health professional. It's just so wonderful to see the community come together and share stories that, I mean, they're, they're like-minded, they, they have the same struggles. And so to be able to provide a peer support group uh, with some support agreements, of course, because we're not trying to fix anybody. We ourselves are not mental health professionals, you know, like just to be, be sure that we're checking some boxes there, but uh, those have been wonderful resources that we've been able to provide through Music Minds Matter. Yes, and just to answer Tiffany's question in the chat, we'll definitely provide links to Music Minds Matter, Sound Nutrition, to, to all of our panelists after the after the event so that you all can connect with them because um, it's definitely worthwhile. There's some great res resources going throughout. Um, for now, I want to kick it back to Emmeline just to talk a little bit more about the links between nutrition and mental health and brain health and performance just because it that feels like your area of expertise. <laughs> yeah. So actually before, before starting sound nutrition, um, and even at the beginning concurrently, which talk about a wild ride, um, at the beginning of starting sound nutrition, even I, I was working full-time as an integrative dietitian within a neurology practice in the Chicagoland area. So, um, so my area of expertise has always been brain health. Um, and, and what we've come to find is that the link between not just brain health and nutrition. So when I say brain health, I'm talking about, um, you know, longevity, protecting and preserving brain health, um, you know, reducing risk of cognitive decline, staying cognitively sharp. So, um, so not necessarily just Alzheimer's prevention, but also some of these Silicon Valley, you know, biohacking buzzwords that you might hear. Um, but, but we're also coming to realize that the link between mental health, not just brain health, but mental health and nutrition is very significant. Um, and, and, you know, with 70% of musicians experiencing mental health struggles, at least according to the, you know, Help Musicians UK study, um, it, we've, we've come to see that nutrition can have a significant impact. Um, as a matter of fact, I've done some tour research data and we had uh, musicians fill out quest musicians and crew fill out questionnaires at the beginning of tour about their dietary practices. Um, so they used standardized research questionnaires um, on their nutrition and then on their mental health and anxiety. And we came to find that nutrition and anxiety in particular scores were perfectly correlated. Um, and, and other mental health issues as well. Um, but in particular, nutrition and anxiety scores were very strongly correlated. Um, and that following a Mediterranean type of diet not only can help with reducing anxiety symptoms, um, but also depression as well and panic attacks. Mm, wow, that's incredible. And I think we all in the background know this, um, we want to make unhealthy choices. And I love what you said about the gas station tip, just because it's good for anyone, regardless of whether you're a musician or not. If you're traveling on the, if you're on the road, that's such a great, because where, where is there to eat? It's fast food and gas stations. And to know that you can still, um, you know, fill yourself up with healthy foods, uh, at least in the interim is so important. So thank you for, for that insight. Um, I want to get into some of the music stuff, just because a lot of folks that'll be watching this and watching it now are musicians and um, I want to kick it to you, Shell, to talk about how sound can work as a connector, whether it's your uh, physical environment surrounding you or the environment of a song. What do you What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, so with sound, what's interesting is we often don't actively think about it, but sound or even the absence of sound, which you could argue is a type of sound, silence, is constantly happening. And so I think when you when you think about it in a music context, the type of sound you're listening to, your body is responding to because sound is vibration, sound is frequency. So if you think if you're going to a hardcore show, you know, that's like more aggressive, like high energy. And so your body, even if you don't want to, like your body's gonna respond to that in some way, as opposed to if you're listening to very ambient, um, maybe instrumental music, that's probably going to you know, be more calm. So there's a way that you can um, really be mindful about the sound musically that you're listening to based on what you're needing um, to support you. Um, and then also sound just in terms of uh, your environment. So a lot of times 
in, for example, meditation, or even in really stepping into the present moment, one of the ways that you will be guided is to notice the sound around you. So if you're in a room, like notice the sounds. Are there people walking around upstairs? Are there, um, you know, switches turning on and off? Is there the AC running? And getting your mind to connect with the sound actually brings you to the present moment that connects you with your, your body. Um, and then I think also then the, the third way you could think about sound is then uh, natural sound. So being outside. Um, so just the pure therapy of hearing birds singing and hearing the wind. And um, there's something about sound that draws you into the moment, whether you realize it or not. But then if you take that extra step to maybe mentally connect with it, it can really bring you into the present. And so um, whether we realize it or not, not sound is creating and and um, affecting us in every single environment that we're in. Um, so it's just deciding how you want to engage with that. Wow. I'm feeling calmer already just from that answer. <laughs> um, that's so great. Thank you. Um, let's talk about folks in the midst of their careers. How do you manage, what coping mechanisms do you recommend for times when your career can be overwhelming, whether that's positive or negative? Because we've all known those folks who like, shot to superstardom or have just gone viral over something bananas, right? And they're just not ready for it. Um, and then obviously there's devastations within a career. You know, you thought that album would do better than it would, or you thought the tour would sell out and it didn't. So what are, <laughs> so what are some of the things that musicians listening can take if they're, um, you know, on either ends of those spectrums? Yeah, I would, I would love to kick this off. I think that's such a great and thoughtful question. And I think oftentimes, there's confusion around talking about mental health. And usually when, when you talk about mental health, there's that negative stigma to it. where like, you can only talk about mental health if you're feeling badly, but honestly, like sharing your successes with mental health is just as important. And I think that like, we often forget that. I think that there's this weird stigma around, like, if you share that you're doing really well, then that might potentially make someone who's not feeling as well, like feel worse or something like that. But honestly, so in Music Minds Matter, we do what we call a stoplight check-in with red, yellow, and green. If you're feeling red, you're very lethargic. You don't want to talk to anybody. If you're feeling yellow, you're just kind of in the middle, kind of meh. And then if you're green, like everything is good. So what we encourage people to do is like, if they're feeling green, then you share that you're feeling green. Like that's a success. Like if you're, if you're kind of battling your demons and you're in a really good spot, we should absolutely like uh, support that and champion that and, and encourage people to work that way towards that direction. But also if people are feeling yellow or orange or red, then we also celebrate that because it's you, there's that awareness that you're feeling that and it's okay to feel yellow. It's okay to feel orange. It's okay to feel red. We're humans, we go through the entire spectrum. So um, it's just that awareness and the work that we do to get ourselves to a better and healthier place. So I just wanted to say that uh, first off, but I think if musicians, and I think Shell said it perfectly, is being in the present moment, there's, there's nothing more humbling and there's nothing more centering than trying to get yourself back to the present moment. I think musicians who are experiencing a lot of success are constantly looking forward to the next thing. Um, and I think that musicians who haven't experienced a lot of success will keep looking back at why didn't this go well? Why didn't this go well? Why aren't people listening to that song I just released? And honestly, and even when Shell was talking about taking those three breaths, I took three deep breaths and I was like, OMG, I felt <laughs> so good. Like it's, it's incredible, the power of breathing, the power of the present moment. So really encouraging musicians and people in the music industry to try to be as present as possible, really enjoy this because musicians, some musicians don't play forever. And so really cherishing the time that you have to be a musician and to play music and to write music um, is something so important. And so, uh, yeah, I just encourage people to try to stay as present as possible. I love that about the red light and green too, because sometimes we aren't, a, I know earlier I talked about self-awareness and how for me, mental health and self-awareness, um, go hand in hand because, you know, I'm able to recognize when symptoms are coming up or when I'm getting out of my routine, but being able to just say red, yellow, green, sometimes it's so much simpler because it takes time to gain the self-awareness and the skills for many people, but to, um, to just identify something is off. That's the first step. Um, so I think that's just such a beautiful, beautiful way. And I, I love the idea that mental health is a journey rather than, 
um, you know, rather than you weren't healthy and now you are, I mean, there's always going to be ebbs and flows and um, it's just getting through those, those, re those red times um, to, you know, get back into the yellow and the green and, and being aware that it's all part of the journey. I think that's such a beautiful way of looking at it. Yeah, thank mm. you. It's not, it's nonlinear, right? Like the, mm -hmm. our journey through mental health is nonlinear. It's not like you start here and this is where you're going to end up. It's, it's ever flowing. It's going in every direction all of the time. And so to be patient and gracious with yourself, like to show yourself grace. And uh, again, having the awareness of doing the check-in with yourself is already a step in the right direction. So uh, being non-judgmental, being patient, being kind, um, and yeah, I think those are really healthy steps to take in your own journey and not just for musicians, but for concert goers and for uh, the people who work uh, in the service industry. And like, it's for everybody. You know, these are the practices that we were talking about is for the humankind, so. Healthcare. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I think um, just to, to add a few things that popped up for me, I think whenever there's overwhelm or anxiety, I view that um, as a, a way to get curious that, the overwhelm is there for a reason. The anxiety is there for a reason. And so almost taking a step back and being like, what brought this up or what is happening here to invite, am I actually doing what I want to be doing? Or as someone told me, I have to do it this way and it's not resonating with me. And so there's this disconnect and anxiety in me and, oh, actually I want to do it this way. So I think one is one approach is thinking about overwhelm or anxiety as an invitation to get curious. And then um, the other thing that popped up for me that I've, I've been sitting with is um, like Spencer was saying that, you know, the journey is nonlinear and Emmeline was talking about like that this is a journey that um, one way to think about it is that we're not musicians or even humans on a journey, but that we are musicians and humans in cycles. And if you think about a year, there's four seasons, there's four cycles. There's no bet like you're going to go through red, yellow, green, your whole career, your whole life. And so to get comfortable with the fact that you're going to go through these cycles and that's just part of being human and definitely part of being a creative um, artistic person. And normalizing that. I think that's so if I could tell my younger self that I would go through the ebbs and the flows and that, you know, and, and that it was and if it was normalized, I think that it would have been a much easier journey. Yes, you're not always going to stay high. You're not always going to be low. I love that. I love that. And I love the idea of celebrating your successes because I think it's the imposter syndrome of it all where, you know, and you're, you're, you're in a community where you are dealing with people at different stages of their career, right? So you don't want to, you know, stir the pot. But at the end of the day, if you're surrounding yourself with a community that sounds like you all are, those people will celebrate alongside you. So I appreciate that perspective. Yeah. Let's talk about um, deadlines. Um, like, what, what do you do in the face of uh, maybe uh, an album release or uh, maybe freelance work if people have like, hey, this is due by 5 p.m. EST um, and that's just your life day to day and you're grateful for that opportunity, but ah, you know, what, what, are we, what, are we, what are we doing um, day to day and what are we doing long term to make sure that we can wake up and say, whatever the day brings, I can handle it. What are some tips? Uh, I have one super practical one that came up for me today. Um, what can I do in the next 30 minutes? That's it. Because what happens when we have a big project and I have a few that I'm juggling right now is we can think of the big thing or if, and we just get so overwhelmed. So what is the overwhelm telling me? It's like, I can't process all of this right now, but I have to do like these 10 to get there. So let me, like, I, I think oftentimes what, creates even more anxiety is we don't actually use the time we have and then we just make it bigger uh so it's like don't even think about like you've got 30 minutes what's one thing you could practically get done and then like oh okay cool what about the next 30 minutes so super practical i'm doing that today i love that and i think too yeah that's it's like the low-hanging fruit model right like what is the most obtainable thing that i can do right now to like make progress i will say like on the flip side like jack white will he will set, uh, he will book studio time. And then when he doesn't have anything written and he's like, well, I got to write and people are coming to the studio to record. So I can't waste their time. So I got to do it. And there is something exciting about that. I do think that like, uh, there is a rush. I've certainly done that before with past projects where it's like, we've set a release date for our music video and I shot and edited the music video. And I was like, okay, well, I guess I'm staying up for 24 hours this entire week, you know, but 
which is which is like exciting and there's that rush but i don't know as far as like sustainability or longevity uh i don't know if that's the right model to do <laughs> so uh for me uh as a musician over the pandemic i really relished in not writing any more music not trying to book shows and try to sell tickets to the same 40 people like hey dad will you come to my show again you know what i mean so i've really taken that time to like relax and reevaluate like the hustle is so real and like you allow the um the pace that everyone else is moving at to really affect you it's like in finding nemo when there's that like jet stream and the turtles are in the jet stream but the the fish are on the outside of it and then they jump into it and then just take off that is like what being in the music scene is like if you see other bands who are just cruising at a thousand miles per hour you feel like you're not doing anything so you have to push the pace but again that pandemic when everything stopped it really was a time to reflect and be like, what are my priorities? Like, what do I really want to accomplish as a musician? Do I just want to put out music for the sake of putting out music? Or do I want to write and perform something thoughtful? Do I want to record something that um, has a specific energy to it that will reach a myriad of different people that we haven't thought before? And so again, it just helped reevaluate, but really just taking your time, doing what you want. Like, like Shell was saying, just what can I do right now? And then once I accomplish that, what can I do after that? And just keep doing that one step in front of the one foot in front of the other. Yeah, I would say for me, mini deadlines, which kind of goes back to what you're saying, uh, Spencer, like smaller mini deadlines, um, finding the one easiest thing on the list, which goes back to what both of you were saying. And then for me also, I've come to find that when I'm really overwhelmed and I have more things to do, sometimes it's easier to waste time because I get into this cycle of, well, I need to do this. And then this email pops up. And so I've, what I've come to find is um, taking time where I'm not even looking at emails and my phone notifications are silenced. Um, and even then taking five minutes of meditation time too, if I'm really, if I'm, you know, really struggling to focus. Um, I think it's so common to think like, oh, I don't have five minutes, but then that five minutes you get back in productivity. Um, so I, that's one practice that I've started is the, even the mini meditation breaks, the, the five minute meditation breaks the, I love the idea of just putting your hand on your chest, taking a few breaths because everybody has time for that. And, um, and, and that can wake up your central nervous system. It can, um, it can calm your mind down. So, and, and th those things then help you focus. Uh, mm -hmm. So just the mini breaks, the mini deadlines so that it's not one looming project and then, um, and then going back to what both of you said, finding the thing that you can do right now is the easiest thing on the list. And limit those distractions as much as possible. Instagram is the bane of my existence. It's like the worst and I'm so addicted to it. Now there's awareness there and I'm like, oh, I'm grateful that I'm aware that I'm addicted to yes. Instagram, but I'm not doing anything about it. So it's like, get that app <laughs> off of my phone. I will like find a way to distract myself if I have deadlines. And so like limiting your distractions and really being able to just like hunker down and focus and really get that work done. And there, and actually there's some strategies and I I've tried moving those apps to off of my home screen on my iPhone so that they're in folders where if I need to access them, I have to go search for them. Um, but then they're not just, because what I realized was that I was, I was picking up my phone and opening Instagram without realizing it. And then 30 minutes later, how did I, how long, how much time have I lost? How, how what have I even looked at? What have I, you know, what have I accomplished in the last 30 minutes and not even realizing my phone was open to Instagram and that I was doing it. It was like, it was like the equivalent of mindless eating, mindless scrolling. Um, and that all, that, that's all part of, I think, like our, our diet, like well, everything that you're, you know, it's, it's, it's all the things that you're seeing. It's if your home is constantly trashed and, you know, and, and chaos everywhere, just how that affects your psyche. So too do all the things that you're looking at throughout the day. I mean, and this kind of, you know, and, and, and that's, there's so many ways in which, you know, our, our environment plays a role in our mental health and in our development. And, um, you know, I think social media is one of those things. Your home environment is one of those things, even your community. If you're walking out the door and you're seeing violence, um, that affects your psyche. So too does looking at your, at your social media and um, maybe not necessarily in the same way, but they both affect us. Social media is the junk food of the brain diet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's, well, there's some positives too. And so that's what's so <laughs> tricky. You know, there are good things to be found on social media there. I'm sure that, you know, all of us have resources on social media that are wonderful things for people to look at and, and they're free resources. It's just, I think it's being mindful about how you consume social media and right. what you're following and maybe having, you know, a time that you go look at it. 
Yeah. Wendy's, Wendy's yeah. has salads too. You know what I'm saying? So. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness okay so quick shout out to the chat if you have questions feel free to pop them in there i have plenty of questions so i'll take us right to the end if i need to <laughs> but you know we want to get the chat in there as well um i want to talk about we talked about red yellow green light so what about if i need to perform and i'm yellow or red what are the tactics i can use i mean i feel like all of you can touch on this is, is there are there certain exercises are there foods i can be using are there meditations i can be doing I want to know how to get myself out of a funk when I've been blessed with a beautiful, huge music career, but I have to perform six nights a week and I don't want to on that six night. What do I yeah. do? I think, I mean, Shell said it right away was like the breathing exercises. I think like as, as a musician and playing with a band, like my relationship with my band is so important. Like I play with three of my favorite people on the planet and we're very transparent with each other about how we're feeling and so being able to center with them as well and um as emily was saying like going on tour like you're going on tour you're spending 24 hours a day in a very confined space with these people so it's like your relationships with your people have to be so tight and how you get those tight relationships is like honest and thoughtful and effective communication so being able to like set up time in your green room to just sit and be like five or 10 minutes before you're set, just like sit and relax. And again, present moment exercises, take those deep breaths, recognize where you are, who you're with and what you're about to do. It's one of your favorite things on the planet. So really try to be present. Something that we want to offer moving forward with Music Minds Matter is what we call red, yellow, green room therapy, or having someone who is a, who is a uh, either peer support or having a licensed mental health professional in the green room to be able to have the conversation with you to help calm those nerves and to have a professional to say, hey, let's just sit down and do some breathing exercises or let's do this mindful meditation for about two minutes before you take stage. So again, just being very thoughtful um, and, and really, you know, you don't have to do this. You don't have to play six nights a week, but you, but you will love it, you know? So it's like, again, re, uh, resorting the priorities and, and how you're feeling and how you're going to get through it. So I think those are a couple of different ways. I think I, I totally agree with everything you just said. I think having a gratitude practice too, where when you wake up in the morning, um, or even maybe it's before you go on stage, thinking of the things you're grateful for, and that can help refocus your intentions for the day, which can certainly affect the way you feel before you go on stage. Um, having a routine too, um, as much as possible, which I realize is very tricky to do on tour, but um, having some constant. So for instance, I always recommend having a uh, essential oil diffuser on the bus, in the van, if possible, in the green room um, and, and you know, diffusing the same essential oil, maybe it's lavender, um, diffusing the same thing before the show, depending on what your, what your mood is. So if you tend to get nerves before the show, lavender is a great option. Um, if you need an energy boost, then, you know, something more citrus based or peppermint. Um, so, you know, having essential oils you diffuse and then you, you recognize that smell and then that can also help calm your nerves having that routine. Um, also being aware of caffeine intake before going on stage, you know, the adrenaline is already going to wake you up. Um, don't necessarily need caffeine. The things that we feed ourselves um, that can certainly affect the way we feel going going on stage and you know even after the set as well um, and then you know looking at looking at your kind of your basics like how am i sleeping um, because that's going to affect the way you feel all day are you eating three regular meals a day because you know when people get hangry and they're already in close quarters that really can affect band dynamics and i hear that a lot um, I, I i hear especially from baby bands you know they spend so much time just trying to figure out where to eat and what to eat and then you know fighting over where to eat and what to eat and then or disagreeing about you know it, it, what's going to be on the rider um and, and especially when the budget is limited and so being able to find harmony or having somebody that can kind of guide you through that process whether it's you know a tour manager who's mindful of those things or whether it is you know some sort of professional help um being able to have somebody that can guide you through that having a plan in place and then sticking to that plan um, as much as you can, of course, things come up, but then, you know, having these healthy routines that then affect the way that you feel daily and then affect the band dynamics, which will so much, you know, that'll affect the way you feel more than probably any other aspect of anything you do on tour is just having harmony within the band because bands break up all the time for, for that exact reason. 
Very real. Yes. I mean, I, I'm sure you've all heard it. You know, people don't necessarily take the best musicians on tour. They take the people that they can be in a, on a bus with for hours and hours on it. You can, you can teach yeah. somebody how to play the bass guitar. You can't teach somebody how to be cool. Exactly. Yeah. So if That's... you can find a way to shift that dynamic, that <laughs> and definitely a plug to, you know, bring sound nutrition on your tour, bring Emma <laughs> with you because uh, I think she'll get you set up straight there. <laughs> Um, I wanted to ask if any of you had any um, experience working with musicians in recovery and how that works in an industry that's so saturated with, you know, drugs and rock and roll and you know what I mean? Um, it's, it's tough, but I think there's a lot of musicians that are in recovery. What are some tips that you have for folks out there that are on that journey? Um, I actually think I, I work with a lot of musicians in recovery because I think that a lot of people change you know, a lot of people who are hiring a dietitian, whether it's, you know, remotely for consulting on tour, whether it's, you know, to come on tour, a lot of people that are on that wellness journey, oftentimes they find that as part of their recovery. Um, so I, I tend to find that I have a bit of a self-selecting clientele. It's generally people that aren't interested in partying every night, or maybe they used to, and they can't anymore. Um, and, and so I, I, my tip would be if you're in that process to look at who you're surrounding yourself with, um, you know, there are, there are resources like, um, send a friend where, you know, you can have a sober, a sober buddy in the audience or in the green room, they can be backstage with you. Um, and, and that's a great, that's a great, um, a, a great resource to be able to have somebody who, you know, in the audience is your sober support person, or they can be as involved as you want. They can, you know, like I so they can be backstage, they can be in the green room. So having a sober buddy, or maybe it's even just, and, and those are all volunteers too, which is great. It's a free resource. Um, or even just having somebody in the band who's kind of your, your buddy or somebody on the crew. So if you have a partner in this, if hopefully they're willing to also be sober or at least to support you in your sober journey, um, somebody that you can talk to, somebody that you can lean on. Um, and then my other piece is, you know, as, as, a, as, pro marijuana as I am, I would say careful about falling into that trap because I've had clients who were sober from hard drugs and alcohol and then went on tour in Asia um, and in places where they can't get marijuana. And that was their, uh, that was kind of something they were using instead of hard drugs and alcohol and then relapsed in on the Asian leg of their tour because they didn't have access to their substitute. And so then they relapsed on alcohol and then it became, a, 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 unfortunately, a very big problem again. Mm. Um, so I would say be careful as, you know, as much as I think there's so many benefits to marijuana, I would say be careful of, of completely using it as a substitute and becoming fully dependent on it. Um, because if you then don't have access to it, particularly in you know, certain areas of the world, um, it's very easy to fall back and uh, to your old vices. And, and, it, and it, it also sometimes is a Band-Aid. And if you're not addressing the underlying causes um, and then your Band-Aid is gone, then uh, it, it can lead to a really tough situation. Very important point, Dress, addressing the underlying causes because that is like the root and then you can deal with everything else on top of that. Yeah, and Jen, also quickly, uh, you know, I'm, I'm practicing dry May. I try to take one month at least out of the year to, to take one full month of no drinking. And I'm really grateful that I chose this month because a lot of challenging things have come up this month where I would have probably relied on the bottle a little bit and have been able to like stay clear headed and make some adult decisions. You know, my, my mom would be so proud. Um, but I, I have been very fortunate uh, to practice that. And, um, we're actually, we are partnering with so far and a group called the Phoenix, uh, to do a, a concert series based on mental health. And we're, we're hosting the Phoenix is a dry facility. It's a recovery facility. Um, and so we're hosting a dry event there, um, and being able to support the Phoenix who have people who are practicing their recovery and their sobriety coming in and, and being able to enjoy a concert, uh, usually in a setting in which, you know, like historically the music scene is you know musicians are getting paid and drink tickets and like bar sales are through the roof you know so being able to provide a, a space for for them to come and uh, enjoy live music is something that we're really excited for and continuing that relationship and encouraging so far to host more events at sober venues um, because the struggle is pretty real for folks who are practicing sobriety um, but others are like yeah you can put me in whatever scene you want like I, I have the strength in order to be out 
wherever uh, and continue practicing my recovery. And so it is an interesting uh, dynamic and something that Music Minds Matter is working towards is what, what if there are sober musicians who are playing and who don't use the drink tickets? Like that's a, a little bit of a slap in the face. It's like, what other options can we provide uh, and support these, these folks who are in recovery? So that's a wonderful question. I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. And it's something that I don't think will be answered right away, but I certainly think that there's a ton of work that we can do uh, heading that direction. Yeah. And having alcohol free, you know, something on the rider that's not just water that can be in the green room, something that's still interesting, you know, maybe it's kombucha, maybe it's, um, you know, yerba mate tea, maybe it's some kind of sparkling water that's flavored of some sort, or, um, you know, ha having different, and even, you know, even things that maybe do have a teeny bit of sugar, but trying not to overdo that too much, because that can certainly affect mental health as well. But, you know, some things that, that are interesting to drink um, that are not just water, because it makes it, it, it makes it more appealing. And then even people who might normally drink alcohol might then say, well, you know, that actually looks really good. Maybe I'll have a kombucha instead. Yeah. Mocktails too. Like, you know, the, the Paloma mocktail where it's just like a pomegranate seltzer water with like rosemary simple syrup. It's like, and then, you know, there's that stigma too behind like, oh, you're not drinking what's wrong with you. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, that's <laughs> aggressive. But, uh, but, you know, it's like some people don't want to have that conversation. Some people don't feel like they need to explain themselves. And so by having a mocktail, you know, even a soda water with lime in it, it's like, oh, okay, they're having a vodka soda or whatever. And it's like, that's a much deeper conversation. But yeah, even still, it's like being able to have more options and know that the venue isn't like trying to shame you for not drinking. It's like, no, we'll make you mocktail. That's completely fine. So kind of rephrasing what's normal uh, in the, in the industry and at venues, it's like, let's start to shift that dynamic a little bit too, and say like, this is all inclusive. We're not trying to exclude folks who, who aren't drinking. So. Yeah. And Marnie, I love how, oh, go ahead. No, no, I was going to say Marnie in the chat just threw that, I threw in that a uh, non-alcoholic beer is like making a comeback right oh, now. <laughs> I was actually going to say something along those lines. I was going to say, I love all of these spirits that are coming up. Um, you know, I've tried flora, I've tried, uh, gosh, what's it called? There's another one I've tried recently that was a very herbaceous, almost gin-like spirit. Um, you know, there's so many different things that you can have now. I, even just at a bar or at a venue, I'll even just get a soda water with a couple, you know, a splash of bitters and a lemon. Um, and that's an easy mocktail that most venues can accommodate versus some of these more interesting spirits. Maybe those are rider items or, you know, hopefully that's the future at venues, but as of right now, not necessarily that consistent. Yeah. I love that. I want to, we talked a little bit about um, apps that we feel might be, uh, you know, rotting our brain, Instagram, TikTok, all of that. Let's talk about um, maybe resources or apps that you can use to your benefit. I think I've used Insight Timer for meditation and things like that, but I don't know if there are any other hidden apps that you can put us on to um, that might be good for meditation, breathing, um, or, or even um, exercise apps on the go. Those I think can be very helpful. Um, that you can grab your phone and be using it for something positive as opposed to maybe negative? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I like Insight Timer. I will use that. Um, they have like a, a little a timer, little timer with a bell, which is nice so that you're not, if you are uh, trying a meditation practice, it can time it and then there's a lovely bell. Um, but there's uh, a lot of really great people doing guided meditations on there. Um, there's also music on there. I actually have some of my music on that space. So if you're um, looking for music that specifically supports um, having like a, a calm time, whether it's meditating or just um, like taking a pause, um, it's on there. Um, one of the things that I do actually is within, it's not an app for this, but Spotify, I create a playlist that I call Space. And whenever I find a song that helps me just be calm, um, and sometimes I'll use this playlist for journaling or just if I need to just take a minute, I'll close my eyes and I'll put on my noise canceling headphones and um, using sound, right, to just help me, um, not even necessarily if I may be not feeling great, but just in general, if I just wanna take a break, I'll use that. So um, kind of pre preemptively thinking about how you can support yourself and even something as simple as a Spotify playlist love that. I love that. I think we have time. I want to get this question because I want to see your thoughts on if you had one regular practice that would benefit people's long-term health, what would it be? I want to hear from each of you on what you think. 
if you could only give somebody one, I mean, Shell, you kind of killed it with the with the three deep breaths. I feel like I could take that. <laughs> yeah, that alone about, will change your life. <laughs> yeah, talk about talk about low hanging fruit. It's like <laughs> just we we breathe ev like we breathe all day, every day. <laughs> but to be mindful and conscious about the breaths that were, it's so good. Uh, I would say uh, I do, there was a book back in the day called The Artist's Way and they did what they called morning pages. And so like waking up in the morning, not touching your phone at all, like wake up, start your morning routine by like making your, if you make coffee in the morning, make your coffee, do your stretches, but really sit down with the intention of journaling, stream of conscious journaling. You're never going to come back and reread this. You're just getting things out of your head. And I do this before I write my to-do lists for the day, before I start to be productive. Um, and also I saw this recently, but it's write down all of the things that you're worried about and then cross out all of the ones that you cannot control and then focus on the ones that you can. So I really think that that will immediately uh, de-escalate some of the stress that you might be feeling just by making a, a small list of the things that you're feeling triggered by mm -hmm. crossing out the ones that you can't control and really focusing on the ones that you can. So journaling and that little exercise, I think would be game changers. Love it. I love that. Uh, I, love both, I love what both of you said. Um, I, I would say if I could only choose one thing, water, um, first and last thing that you consume during the day, I'm a, a religious coffee drinker, but it's never the first thing that I drink during the day. It's always at least 16 fluid ounces of water. If you want to get fancy, you can throw some lemon in there. Um, sometimes I'll do a, you know, a ginger shot as well in the morning time. Um, but I would say it, no matter what, whether I'm on tour, whether I'm at home, whether I'm traveling, it's always at least 16 fluid ounces of water first thing. And then the last thing that, that you drink for the day or eat should always be water as well. And, and then if you are drinking alcohol, you know, of course, having uh, water between alcoholic beverages, um, I, I think hydration, I used to think it was just a matter of, you know, affecting, I, I, I used to think it's just a matter of not being dehydrated. Um, and, you know, the, and the dehydration is, you know, bad for digestion, uh, bad for your energy levels, but I've come to find that it's also mental health. Um, it affects your mental health. It affects your energy levels. It affects how well you sleep. Of course, if you're chugging a bunch of water at night, it's going to affect how you sleep negatively, <laughs> but most of the time it affects how you sleep in a positive way. Um, and, in, and it is, has been such a game changer for me to just focus on hydration, both on tour and off. So I would say if there was nothing else I could say, it would be, if there's, if there's only one tip, it would be water. Yeah. Mm. And for most people, at least two liters a day, which for, for a lot of people is going to seem like a lot, but if you're active, if you're performing on stage, you might need even more than that. Uh, Spencer, I love that you mentioned morning pages. I totally do that every morning. Um, well, there's a number have been mentioned, but if I could throw a new one in there, it would be uh, try to go for a walk every day. And when I say a walk, I have a loop that I do. I did even before this call, it's eight minutes. It's so, it's short, right? It's eight minutes, but getting in your body, not walking like this with your phone, either leave your phone in, at home or turn on airplane mode, but just move your legs, move your body, get some sun, see something green, go for a walk, even if it's five minutes, um, can really change everything. And no phone during that time, because I got in such a good habit of walking every day during the pandemic. And then I realized that I wasn't always feeling refreshed after my walk because I was on my phone the entire time where I was like cranked over like this the entire time. And so now I put my phone in my pocket or I leave it at home and I just have my watch. So if there's like an emergency, then, you know, I can be contacted. Um, yeah, no phone on that walk. Just get, you know, the sunshine, take it all in. Major key. I love these tips. Can we quickly go around the room and say where folks can find you? I'll put this all in the recap email and this, um, we'll live on our YouTube as evergreen content so everybody can hear this amazing conversation, but just drop your ads or the best place to find you. Uh, Shell, start. Uh, I would say I have a website, but I'm on Instagram pretty much every day. And that's where I like to build community and connect. So hit me up, hit my DMs. What's your at? It is at Our Daughter Music. Emmeline. I'm at soundnutrition.co on Instagram. And I actually just got TikTok. So I'm on TikTok as well. I have three followers on there. Oh. <laughs> All right, Spencer. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, musicmindsmatter.org is the best way to find us. Uh, you can email me uh, directly at spencer at musicmindsmatter.org. On the website, you can learn about mental health first aid, what we're doing there. 
uh, our meetups that we're hosting on meetup.com um, and any other information that you might need from us should be living on that page. So uh, that's where you can find us. This is great. This has been such a soul filling conversation. I'm so grateful to each and every one of you. Thanks for coming. And I'm Jen Mendia. Thanks y'all. Have a great day. Thanks everybody.